All right, so we got to see chapter 1083 in its entirety, and it's surprisingly lining up with the spoilers that we got. There were some worries about the spoilers maybe not being entirely accurate, but that's not the case. Pretty much everything that we were told is playing out here. But of course, we're getting more context and nuances than what we were able to see before, just from reading these spoilers, because we get to see the panels and everything. And I want to go over the most significant thing that is revealed in this chapter, which is, of course, the Holy Knights. But let me just go over how we got to this point. So at the end of the previous chapter, it was revealed that Sabo was in fact alive, which we pretty much assumed, because, you know, he of course survived the attack on Lelugia, he was on a boat at a distance, watching it get nuked, and he was eventually able to make it back to the Revolutionary Army in Kamabaka Queendom, and he met back up with Dragon and Ivankov and started to tell them everything that had transpired. Now, we thought that he was going to talk about Emu and the Empty Throne, which was implied from the end of the previous chapter, but I, I don't know, I guess they're talking about it off panel or something, or they just claim over it because it's not being mentioned here. But what Sabo does say is that all of their objectives have been taken care of, is that they declared war on the Celestial Dragons by also destroying their symbol. They rescued Kuma and also freed as many slaves as possible. And we kind of knew all this already for the most part, aside from them freeing as many slaves as possible, which is always cool. But they also mentioned that they were able to destroy Mary Joie's food reserves. But not only that, other members of the Revolutionary Army are also attacking government supply carriers all over the world to stop resources from reaching Mary Schwa. This is an amazing development. I love this kind of warfare, especially on the side of the good guys, taking down like the hideous evil bad guys here. And I say good guys because the Revolutionary Army is probably the most altruistic faction in the series besides the Straw Hats. And it's just so refreshing and satisfying to see the Celestial Dragons finally getting a taste of their own medicine. And Ivankov echoes those sentiments in this chapter because, you know, like their whole thing is being like hedonistic sociopaths. So it's nice that the tables are finally turning on them. And this is for sure starting the motion that is going to lead us into the final war here. And more and more mutinies are going to come of this because we also find out that there's other countries that are just straight up not paying their taxes anymore to the Celestial Dragons. And while this is great and all, and they're gaining some serious momentum, Dragon in this instance is staying steadfast. And he's like silently saying that they've done a good job, I suppose. But he's also like, you know, they're not just a foe who will just take all of this lying down, which is of course true. I mean, if you just make the tiniest slight against the Celestial Dragons, you'll pretty much get shot in the head. So straight up waging war against them and cutting off their food supplies and everything, you can imagine how angry they're going to be. And that's when Dragon says, our real battle will start when they mobilize the Holy Knights or God's Knights, whatever translation you want to go by. And we finally see the silhouette of these Holy Knights here. Now these Holy Knights were also mentioned in chapter 1054 by Aki Inu. I think that was the first time in the series we were told about these individuals. And by my count, there's at least nine of them. There could be more, but I just see nine here in the silhouettes. Now I'm on board with this. I love this idea from Oda. I think it's much needed to have this final powerhouse collective, like the true one above all bad guy faction, because that's essentially what this is. And I'm pretty sure they are even above admirals. Because as I've also mentioned before, the world government and the Marines just don't have enough on their side, which is interesting because usually in these battle manga series, it's more so lopsided on the other end of the spectrum. It's like the good guys or the heroes or whatever who don't have enough strong people or firepower. And it's always the villains who are way overpowered and have too much. But now I think this is Oda's way of balancing that out. Because also considering that we're going into the end game here, you know, the final saga, there's not enough quote unquote Yonko level guys to go around because even just on the Straw Hat crew, there's like three or four guys who can comfortably fight against admirals, if not just straight up beat them high diff. So we need to raise the stakes at this point and we need this ambiguous, all powerful force, which is I think the Holy Knights here. And some people might say like, oh, it's too late to introduce them and kind of, but better late than never. But also keep in mind, Emu, the final boss of the series, was introduced in chapter 906. So it's fine if they're introduced here. We still have, at least by my estimation, five or six years left in this series. So there's plenty of time to hype them up, plenty of time for people to job to them to establish their power. But aside from that, let's address the elephant in the room here. And it's this silhouetted individual in the center. Now, when the spoilers first came out, the leakers straight up said to us that this looks like Shanks. It might be Shanks. Now, for me, if I were to just view this panel in a vacuum, I wouldn't have thought that this looked like Shanks.
Shanks. Because, at least at first glance, it doesn't. It just looks like a cool, maybe guy with like a cloak and a sword. And the sword is the only thing that really looks kind of like Shanks, I guess. It looks like his sword, Griffin. But then again, Griffin is somewhat of a ubiquitous sword in this series. I mean, Roger had Ace, which is a Griffin-like sword. And then we saw in the Empty Throne, there's a bunch of other Griffin-esque swords there. Even in Emu's throne room, there is, you know, like a Griffin-esque sword. And when I say Griffin-esque, I mean like uh, the rapier design. Man, that's a hard word to say on YouTube. Hey, YouTube algorithm god, I am just talking about a sword design here. And that type of sword is French. It dates back, I think, to the 18th century. And another thing that I think ties back to the French here is like the musketeers, which I assume that these are like directly under Emu. Like if Emu is the one above all in One Piece at this moment, then these are like the right hands to Emu. And like I said, they're probably most definitely stronger than the Admirals. I wouldn't even be surprised if there's some guys here that are stronger than Aka Inu. But we're just taking guesses here. We have absolutely no feats on them. We don't even know what they look like. Now, is it possible that this is Shanks? For sure. I mean, we saw that Shanks is pretty cool with the Gorosei, and Shanks did wear this black cloak type thing, which could be paralleling to what we're seeing here now. And you know, there's this big popular theory out there, I've made multiple videos on it, that Shanks is probably a celestial dragon himself. Comes possibly from the Figureland family, which was mentioned in the supplementary material for the film Red Movie. And also, I think Oda confirmed, or I don't know, maybe implied that Shanks was found as a baby by Roger at God Valley, where we know that celestial dragons were habitating. So if Shanks is actually the leader or the top holy knight here, that would be incredible. And I would be so on board with it. But I just want to pull us back for a moment. And I don't want to hype you guys up any more than we have already been hyped up. Because like I said, it just doesn't at first strike me as Shanks. And you guys know me. I'm always down for a big, nice, spicy theory. If it even holds just a little bit of water, I will probably jump on board with it. But with this one, I just can't do it yet. Maybe if we get a little more info, I'll gladly jump on the train and tell you guys that this is absolutely Shanks. But I just can't do that yet. But I will say that I hope it is because that would be an incredible twist. Shanks being a holy knight or the top holy knight. And he was the whole time. And he's been moving lighting as a Yonko because I don't know whatever he loves Roger but that would also be the perfect you know one above all in the world government because we see how powerful Shanks is so if their top guy is Shanks that would be fitting because we saw that he completely destroyed an admiral in Green Bull without even touching him like from a mile or whatever away however far away he was he just neutralized Green Bull with just hockey and we don't even fully understand what he did to him so if that's like their top guy it's like sign me up and then, you know, the whole twist and the revelations that come with that, I'm on board. But if it's not Shanks, then it could be a Shanks relative, maybe another member of the Figureland family, maybe Shanks' his brother, maybe Shanks' his dad. There's no real evidence to support that yet. I don't think there's even any real breadcrumbs we can go off of, aside from if Oda deliberately drew Shanks without a scar or deliberately showed the right side of his face to purposely not show the left side to show that maybe his brother doesn't have the scars because also Oda said in an SBA, or something that sometimes he forgets to draw the scars. Verdict's still out, but it is still possible. It is a part of that group. Or it's just some new, crazy, powerful celestial dragon guy, and he's just God for some reason. Who knows? Now, going back to the Musketeers, maybe that could explain why Mihawk and Shanks are cool or have the rivalry that they do. Because another thing that people have been saying for years about Mihawk is that he looks like he was based off of a Musketeer, and also Dracula. He's kind of like a Dracula Musketeer. So if Mihawk was also a holy knight at one point because you know also keep in mind that his sword yoru has similar markings that the empty throne has now maybe it's a coincidence maybe it's not but it is something interesting to look at so if mihawk was a holy knight then that could explain why he like i said cool with shanks and they had that rivalry and everything like they were both holy knights and then mihawk defected and then shanks is doing whatever shanks is doing because aside from that, we don't know anything about them. We don't know much about Shanks. We know even less about Mihawk. And I think this would be a really cool way for that to come together. Like they both came up in the Holy Knights. That's how they became so ultra powerful. You know, iron sharpens iron and then whatever other crazy training that they were doing to make this elite squad. And that, you know, perfectly explains why they are so powerful. But that's just a crazy out there theory. 
I mean, yeah, it would make sense writing-wise and everything, but, you know, Oda doesn't play by our rules. He makes the game. We kind of just have to play by his rules. But let me know what you think about this in the comments. Who do you think the Holy Knights are? Do you think that Shanks is the leader of the Holy Knights here? Do you think that Mihawk was a Holy Knight at some point? Let me know. And if you liked the video, guys, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.